back to the <laughs> the nitty gritties of uh, doing things. There's so many little little things that we need to uh, think of. But thank you so much. That's thank you for that reminder. Okay. Okay. So we'll look at uh, the introduction to the book of. Um, uh, Romans before we look at uh, we study each verse phrase or word in each chapter we we'll just look at uh, the introduction to the Romans thank you all for sharing your uh, insights your and giving your inputs about what you know about the book of Romans um, now Romans is considered as uh, the most important book uh, theologically or uh, doctrinally because it uh, deals with uh, the doctrine of Christ um, now we all know what is doctrine right doctrine is basically a set of beliefs a belief or a set of beliefs uh, that is taught by someone uh, or basically we can say doctrines are teachings uh, so we see that in this book um, you know in the book of romans the gospel of jesus is presented very very uh, beautifully doctrinally like no other epistle okay no other epistle presents the gospel of uh, jesus christ as well as it is explained here in the book of uh, uh, romans and scholars uh, consider uh, paul's letter to the believers at rome as his most important work uh, doctrinally okay so this is his uh, paul's uh, most important work doctrinally and romans is one of the best expressions of christian doctrines uh, you know compared to other books um, uh, the other epistles you know of um, of Paul addresses certain elements of Christian life or the life of the church. Uh, but here in this book, Paul addresses certain pro uh, and in those books, Paul addresses certain problems in the church, uh, uh, which the church is uh, facing. So he's writing to them about uh, the problems that they're facing in the church. But here in this episode of Romans, it's more doctrinal and it's more uh, teaching oriented. It's not just talking basically about uh, certain elements of Christian life or the life of the church or uh, talking about some issues or challenges or problems that the church is facing. It's, um, it's more an episode that has to do with doctrines and it's more teaching uh, oriented so we see that uh, he paul begins uh, this epistle uh, from you know the existence of god and then he goes on to talk about sin he talks about salvation the gift of righteousness uh, the grace of god uh, in christian living and uh, we see that this is the best episode when it comes to christian doctrine or uh, to teaching it's not just because i'm teaching Teaching Romans, I'm saying this, but this is, you know, the best epistle uh, when it comes to Christian doctrine or a uh, teaching. So it's very important for us to study and understand uh, this book uh, because uh, this is the only place in the New Testament where we have about three chapters uh, that explains to us the relationship between the church and uh, Israel. Okay, the book of Hebrews has uh, some of it, but in terms of, uh, uh, it talks about in terms of the covenant, uh, but here, um, you know, we see uh, in the book of Romans, we see what God is doing with the church, uh, and uh, you will find what God is doing with the church only here in the book of uh, Romans. Again, it's uh, very uh, unique uh, from that perspective. And uh, the entire uh, Old Testament, uh, when we see read the Old Testament, uh, we see God dealing with his people, uh, the, uh, the Israelites, the Hebrew people. Okay, It also mentions uh, in the Old Testament, there are various prophecies uh, uh, referring or mentioning to the coming of uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And then we move on to the New Testament, where it starts off with Jesus and uh, his ministry here on earth and what he did. And then it moves on to Acts where we see the early church. Um, and uh, suddenly we wonder what happened to Israel. Okay, that's because the Old Testament we are reading 
all about the Israelites, you know, how God dealt with them, how God brought them out of bondage, um, you know, the laws he gave them, what he taught them, the kings, the judges, uh, the prophets who came, uh, 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 and uh, how they occupied the promised land. Uh, and all of those, we read so much about the Israelites, the Hebrew people, but uh, you know, uh, all that comes to a full stop when we move to the New Testament, where it begins with Jesus, his ministry, then the early church. And we're wondering what happened to um, uh, God's dealing with the people of um, uh, Israel. So um, we see here in the, in the book of Romans, Paul very beautifully, you know, brings us, uh, brings out to us the relationship between the church and uh, Israel. So he brings back into the picture the Israelites, their calling, where they are, uh, what God is doing with them, what God has planned for them, that he's not forgotten them, that he still has them in their, in his plan, in his uh, purpose. So there are many key doctrines or teaching that is established here in the book of Romans. Um, we see the existence of God uh, in chapter 1, the issue of sin and conscience, uh, uh, we see the issue of salvation, the issue of grace, the issue of righteousness, and the issue of Christian um, living. So, so these are some of the key teachings um, uh, of the uh, you know of the church, and all of these key teachings of the church is covered here in the book of um, Romans. Okay, so let's look at when Paul wrote this book and why he wrote it, and what are some of the things that uh, Paul was expecting to um, happen. Okay, so during uh, Paul's second uh, missionary journey, which is AD 49 to 52, uh, now all of what we are talking about happening in, uh, you know, with, with uh, regard to the epistle um, of Romans, it all happens in the first century, and these are kind of approximate dates. So during uh, Paul's second missionary journey, he stayed at uh, Corinth for uh, uh, 18 months. We read about this in Acts chapter 18, verse 11. And, um, and during this time when he was at Corinth, he comes uh, in contact with uh, this couple, uh, Aquila and uh, Priscilla, who are a Jewish couple, and uh, they are from Rome. And um, they had to leave Rome because um, uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Claudius, you know, he issued an edict saying that all the Jews had to leave Rome. And we read about this in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. So we see that uh, Aquila and Priscilla being a Jewish couple, they had to leave Rome and they come to Corinth and, um, you know, uh, and when they are in Corinth, they, you know, they meet, um, um, uh, they meet Paul, okay? And, um, and we see that, um, you know, Paul through Aquila and Priscilla heard a lot about the church at Rome, about the believers at uh, at Rome, uh, they worked with Paul in the tent making uh, business, and also they ministered uh, with the churches and the believers at uh, at Corinth. And we also see that Paul was um, uh, was very instrumental in uh, teaching them, building up, building them up in the things of uh, of the faith and the revelation of God's word because uh, we know that Paul was very scholarly uh, he had studied under the best teachers and one of them being Gamaliel and uh, uh, so you know um, uh, they also had first hand experience of how Paul ministers uh, how he handles churches how he builds up leaders so they learned quite a lot and um, uh, we see that the Jews were permitted to go back to Rome in AD 54 and uh, so Aquila and Priscilla goes back um, uh, to Rome and uh, when they go back they would have shared about Paul's uh, ministry to the believers uh, at the church at um, Rome but um, we see that you know um, uh, Paul was so excited about the church at Rome even though he had not planted the church there uh, but uh, just to hear about everything that is happening and it was his great desire um, uh, to go to um, uh, to the church at Rome to meet the believers there and just like Rupa said you know to impart to them uh, to uh, 
pour into their lives to uh, to uh, spiritually feed them uh, what he has learned what he has received as uh, revelations um, so later during uh, paul's third missionary journey which is uh, during ad 53 to 58 we see that paul spends um, a good three years in ephesus and from there he goes on to macedonia and to greece uh, and you know which it includes cities like athens and uh, corinth and so we see that Paul, when he was there in his third missionary journey back at Corinth, uh, he wrote to the believers at Rome and he writes this letter around uh, or about AD 50. Um, seven. So how do we know that uh, Paul wrote this letter from uh, uh, Corinth? Uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, Paul mentions uh, two people there. He mentions Gaius and Erastus. Now, uh, Gaius is somebody who Paul was staying along with. He was hosting uh, Paul. And also we know that uh, Gaius had a church, uh, or Gaius had a church uh, meeting at his home. So Romans chapter 16, verse 23. Can one of you read that, please? Romans 16, 23. Gaius, my host and the host of the world church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Carthus, a brother. Okay. So here we see that Paul is uh, staying at the home of Gaius, and also uh, he mentions, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gaius, the same Gaius he mentions in Corinth, uh, in First Corinthians. Um, chapter 1 was uh, 14 okay and we also see he mentions about Erastus who was um, a treasurer a treasurer of the city of Corinth he was a steward or he was heading the public works uh, department as uh, you know we see in uh, translated in the new test in the in NIV version uh, so he, we see that he lived in Corinth. We read about him in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, second letter to Timothy, second Timothy chapter four, verse um, uh, uh, 20. And, um, you know, um, uh, archaeologists have found, uh, uh, have uncovered or unearthed a stone in which uh, was an inscription of the name of Erastus. And it says, Erastus for his edelship paved at his own expense, uh, which is usually, you know, um, when people uh, make roads, uh, uh, you know, in honor of their name, they have uh, this cornerstone laid and saying that, you know, this person has, uh, has done this, has laid this road. So he has, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, paved a road and uh, made a road and uh, at his own expense and so they found uh, a stone which was unearthed by uh, archaeologists uh, and uh, it uh, in in the city of Corinth which mentions the name Erastus so we know that um, you know Paul would have written this um, uh, this epistle of uh, Romans from uh, Corinth during his third missionary journey. We also see that towards the end of uh, Paul's letter in Romans chapter 15, verses 22 to 23, Paul, uh, uh, you know, mentions that uh, he's planning to go to Jerusalem uh, because there is a famine that is happening there and he's uh, collected offerings from um, the churches in the regions of uh, Greece and Macedonia and he plans to take this offering to give it to the saints who are living in uh, Jerusalem uh, because of the famine. Uh, he just feels the need to help them. And then he plans uh, to go from there to, um, uh, to Spain. And on his way to Spain, uh, you know, he uh, plans to stop at Rome and he plans to um, uh, meet the church, which is his, uh, his uh, long... Uh, longing his desires, a uh, longing desire which he had for many years, which we read in Romans chapter 15, verse 22 to 33. So can one of you read that, please? Romans 15, 22 to 33. Okay. 
Anyone? Ma'am, this is um, Erna Okay, please read, brother. Okay, thank you. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming in coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Yes, till 33. Okay, till 33, okay. Uh, uh, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way uh, thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtor de, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual thing, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may deliver from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Now the Lord of peace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Sri Kumar. So here we see uh, Paul's heart in verse 23. He says, you know, he says, for many years, you know, having a great desire this many years to come to you. And in verse 29, he says, you know, I like to come. When I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So we see Paul's heart here that he wants to go to the believers at Rome and he wants to bring to them um, something uh, spiritually. He wants to give into their lives spiritually. He feels he can give to them spiritually. And this is his motivation in um, going there. You know, some of us are, uh, some of you are itinerary ministers, evangelists. You go from place to place. So what basically motivates uh, you to go to uh, place to place from one city to another city to preach? I'm sure it's not sightseeing. It's not uh, recreational. But um, it's, uh, you know, a motivation to give them something in the uh, spirit. It's a desire that you have to impart to them, uh, you know, the full blessings of the gospel of Christ. And you want to strengthen them um, spiritually. And that is why, you know, people are motivated, to, uh, evangelists, missionaries are motivated to go from place to place uh, to preach about uh, Christ. So Paul also shares what he's uh, planning uh, to do and uh, his desire, his desire is that he wants to give into their life spiritually. He wants to impart to them uh, the full blessings of uh, Jesus Christ. And he also is sharing uh, with them his plan that, you know, there is a famine in Jerusalem and uh, he wants to encourage the saints and the believers at Jerusalem. Um, uh, and so he's encouraging the, the churches that he started in the regions of Achaia, that is Corinth and Macedonia, to contribute to the saints in Jerusalem. And he wants to take this offering to the believers there. And then from there, he wants to go to Spain. And on his way, you know, he wants to go to Rome. Uh, he plans to visit Rome and visit the believers uh, there. Okay. So who started uh, the church at Rome? Um, like you said that uh, no one in particular we don't have a specific name of a person who started uh, the church at rome um, but oh, we know that on the day of pentecost you know there were uh, visitors from 
various nations, people who came from, uh, there are Jews who came from Rome, uh, from different parts of Asia, from Europe, they all came to Jerusalem. And uh, when they, they came to Jerusalem, they used to come for a period of 60 days uh, where they used to begin with, uh, with the celebration of the unleavened bread and also the Passover and three days later they would uh, be there for the feast of the first fruits um uh, which was uh, and you know which was the, the which was the beginning of um, uh you know of um, the pentecost which would happen 50 days from then so they used to stay for the feast of the first fruits and then stay on for another 50 days and uh you know um celebrate uh, the pentecost and then go back to their own uh, places and we know what happened on the day of pentecost um you know um we read this uh, in acts chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 so can one of you please read acts chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 please Acts chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Acts chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Parthians and Medes, and Elamites, and the resident of Mesopotamia. Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, difficult to read, Pigia and Pamphylia, Egypt and part of Libya, Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome. Thank you. Visitors from Rome, uh, thank you. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking uh, in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So we see that, you know, people, Jews came from all over Asia and Europe and there were also uh, Jews from Rome and uh, when they heard this hurricane like uh, wind that came and they came to this uh, upper room where uh, uh, the 120 believers were there and saw them speaking in different tongues they re realized that they're Galileans but speaking in their own native languages which the places that they had come from and they all heard them you know praising and worshipping God and uh, we know that Peter you know delivered his sermon and 3,000 of them accepted uh, Jesus and were baptized and came into faith so you know uh, so there were some of the Jews who were uh, present at that time uh, who would have accepted uh, Jesus Christ and then you know they stayed on and um, you know uh, they received teachings from the apostles they received the teachings of the apostles and they were established in the teachings of the apostles and then uh, they would have gone back to rome and uh, they would have uh, you know uh, started preaching and teaching uh, to the people there and that's how you know they made uh, believers and uh, established uh, home churches uh, in different parts of um, Rome, and we can say that uh, the church at Rome was a very spiritual church. Um, the reason is because you know um, these people who are there on the day of Pentecost, you know, they received the teachings of the apostles, and they were also established in the teachings of the um, apostles. And we know that the uh, the believers at Rome were a mixed group, the a mixed group of Jews of Gentiles. Um, and uh, uh, and you know when Emperor Claudius uh, issued that edict in uh, AD 49 that all Jews had to leave Rome, uh, you know we know that the church would have been led by the Gentile believers. But when uh, in AD 54 when they returned back. You know, after five years, the Jews are uh, asked to give in permission to return back to Rome. When they came back, uh, you know, they would have realized that the leaders who are leading the church at Rome uh, were Jewish um, uh, believers and, uh, sorry, uh, Gentile believers. And uh, so the Jews realized that they had to serve under uh, the Gentile believers. So we see that uh, 
there was a mix of uh, Jews and Gentiles at the church at Rome. And uh, so we see when Paul is writing this letter, he knows that he ha has to address uh, to both of these uh, groups. Uh, we know that uh, there were several home churches at, uh, at Rome. Um, and uh, we know that when Paul uh, was uh, writing in AD 57, uh, he talks about the, the church that meets in Aquila and Priscilla's house. We read this in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 5 to 5. Can one of you read that, please? Romans 16, 3 to 5. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ, who risked their own neck for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the church, churches and the, of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epanetus, who is the first fruits of a key as to Christ. Thank you. So here we see that there were house churches at Rome. Uh, they did not have just one main church, but there were several house churches. We know this because Paul writes, um, when he's writing this uh, epistle of Romans, uh, he's talking, he's greeting Aquila and Priscilla and also the believers who are meeting uh, in their uh, home. Okay. Um, uh, and so he knows that his letter will be, uh, will you know, when he sends it to Rome, uh, will be read across all the house churches, and uh, it would be a, a, a letter that would build them up and encourage them. Okay, so we look at a few highlights, key highlights of the book of um, uh, Romans. Just, uh, we look at a brief background. Uh, we look at a few key highlights or emphasis that we will see in the book of Romans. Uh, the book of Romans uh, explains the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very detailed way, in a very clear way. Uh, it very clearly explains to us what the gospel is. It explains to us that we are sinners, that Christ died for us, he rose again, and whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness of their uh, sins. So we have in this episode one of the clearest and the deep detailed explanations of the gospel of Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, we also see uh, one of the key highlights of the book of Romans is that it's uh, a book where our full spiritual journey is mentioned in a very detailed way, is very is described in a very detailed way, starting with the existence of God in Romans chapter 1, then talking about uh, the sin of man in Romans 1 and 2, the consequences of sin in Romans chapter 3, what Christ did on the cross for our sins in Romans chapter 3 and 4, how we are justified by faith and how we receive righteousness uh, through grace by faith, which is spoken of in Romans chapter 5 or explained in Romans chapter 5, how we can overcome sin on the basis of the cross, what Jesus has done on the cross. Uh, we see this in Romans, we read this in Romans chapter 6 and 7, how we walk in the spirit, how we walk in righteousness in the spirit in Romans chapter 8 and how we um, live the Christian life in Romans chapter 12 verse 15. So here in the book of Romans, Paul describes our spiritual journey. So if anyone or uh, reads the book of Romans, if someone reads the book of Romans, you know, they can surely get saved. They will learn how to overcome sin. Um, they will learn how, uh, you know, they'll be justified by uh, through grace, by faith. They will learn how to live the Christian life. So it's a good uh, journey that Paul takes someone through, uh, right from uh, them knowing God, the existence of God, to uh, knowing their sinful nature and um, uh, to, uh, to knowing what Christ has done on the cross and how they can accept him as their Lord and Savior and uh, how they can live uh, a life uh, of righteousness uh, in the spirit and how they can live their Christian life. So it is, uh, it's um, a good journey that Paul takes someone 
through. Another key highlight is in the book of Romans, um, you know, the righteousness of God is revealed. So we know that God is a God of justice. Uh, he cannot be blamed. Uh, he's blameless. He's a righteous God. And so we see that the major theme in the book of Romans is righteousness. Uh, the word righteousness is used 36 times throughout this book. Uh, we see that uh, it's spoken about of God being righteous in judging sin. Uh, we read this in Romans chapter 1 and 2. Uh, God who is righteous uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a righteous God, you know, he forgives sins on the basis of what Christ has done on the cross. We read this in Romans chapter 3 and 5. And uh, God imputing uh, his righteousness, or God imparting his righteousness. That means God uh, putting his righteousness into our account uh, as believers. And we are being made in right standing with God. We read this in Romans chapter 5. Then um, in uh, Romans chapter 6 uh, to 8, we read about uh, how a believer can walk in righteousness uh, by the work of the Spirit. And in Romans chapter 12 to 15, we see how a believer can live a righteous um, life. And we don't find this treatment or we don't find this detailed explanation of, uh, of righteousness in any other book in the Bible as we find in, um, in Romans. And uh, another key highlight is uh, that in the book of Romans, the Jews and the Gentiles are both chosen. Uh, in Romans chapter um, uh, chapters 9 to 11, we see Paul uh, addresses the relationship between Jews and Gentiles uh, or uh, Israel and the church. He also talks about what God is doing. Uh, where is Israel and, the, uh, and the, how does the church fit in what God is doing presently? And in Romans chapter 9 to 11, Paul addresses that. Um, and we also see that uh, this treatment or this specific topic or this specific uh, account or this, um, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, about the Israelites, about uh, the church, about the Jews and Gentiles and what God is doing and where they are now in history, in the picture or in the plan and the purpose of God. It's not mentioned, uh, the subject is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament as it is mentioned uh, detaily here in uh, Romans. And hence, you know, um, it's a very interesting part uh, to study uh, the book of um, Romans. Okay. Uh, we'll stop here. Uh, any questions anyone has? Any questions, any doubts? Yes. Yes, Shri Kumar. Pastor, um, I just want to know one thing that, uh, uh, as you said, this is um, uh, this is more than an epistle; it is a doctrine. Doctrine. So I just want to know that when we read the Bible, how can we come to know that this is a doctrine and this is an epistle? How we come to know? Like in the book of, uh, I think, in Timothy or uh, in those books. There also Paul has given him some instruction. So uh, do we consider that also as a doctrine or uh, as a letter? Thank you, Pastor. Uh, good question. Thank you, uh, Sri Kumar. Um, see, every epistle that Paul writes, he will address certain doctrines that are specific uh, to certain churches with, uh, in, with regards to the challenges, with regards to the problems or the difficulties that they face. So. Um, Paul would, um, would uh, mention or refer to the struggles, the challenges, the, uh, the problems that they are facing in light of the doctrines or the teachings, um, because that will bring more clarity to what they are going through. So we're not saying that there are no doctrines that are mentioned in any of um, uh, uh, the other episodes, but what we're saying is in this uh, in this um, uh, letter to the Romans, he very clearly takes us through our spiritual journey where he's mentioning um, uh, the teachings about sin, about uh, justification, about salvation, uh, about righteousness uh, uh, through grace by faith in a very uh, detailed way. So uh, when we look at, uh, when we study this book, we would look at, 
you know, there are not more challenges or problems that he is uh, addressing it and uh, and bringing it out in the context of doctrines, but he's basically presenting the doctrines. He's basically presenting the teachings of Jesus Christ in a very systematic, in a very clear uh, way so that one could understand their own spiritual journey and uh, how they can walk through uh, each of these stages in life. Does that help you, you answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Who is the first fruits of Akia to Christ uh, 16 5? Uh, Romans 16 5. Let me just take a look at that. Okay, Romans chapter 16. Likewise, greet the church in their home. Uh, greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Uh, first fruits of Achaia. Achaia is a place. Um, so maybe uh, the first fruits is, um, you know, uh, those who are uh, believers, first time believers. Okay, um, new believers who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and um, uh, in that certain place. Uh, and also go back and also, you know, uh, after they have accepted Christ, they uh, kind of uh, share the gospel with uh, the people in their own region, their own areas. Or if uh, like we see that in the church at uh, uh, Rome, there were believers who came to Jerusalem. They were there on the day of Pentecost. They experienced uh, salvation. They were, uh, uh, you know, they received teachings. They were established in the teachings of the apostles and they go back to Rome and they preach teach and teach and, uh, and they establish uh, uh, the church. So maybe uh, this was, um, Epinetus was one of the first fruits of Achaia, that means person from the place called Achaia who, to accept Christ and also maybe to share uh, to believers and um, uh, start of a house church at that place, Achaia. So Achaia is, uh, is where basically Corinth is, yes. Okay, ma'am, thank you very much. Yes, Christopher. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. I uh, just wanted to uh, kind of understand how effectively we can you know, use the notes that you've already provided to us and, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, use it effectively during the class. Uh, so I, as I understand, today's class was more of an introduction. Mm -hmm. But when you go through a verse-by-verse -verse, uh, uh, interpretation and uh, explanation of that particular verse, um, will you be actually referring to the notes and, you know, because right now I'm just looking at my desk. I have the Bible open. I have uh, your notes open. I have, uh, obviously, I'm, you know, got, you know your, the presentation that you are doing currently. Um, and um, I just try to understand how, you know, how best uh, I can effectively, or we can effectively, um, you know, as a student, uh, use your notes uh, in the class. Okay, thank you for your question, uh, Christopher. Uh, yes, today, uh, if you notice, I didn't stick, I mean, I had spoke basically from uh, the notes, but uh, it was not word to word at this uh, mention there. I just didn't say every line that was there. But uh, most of the content, uh, uh, the explanation is there so you can read it. Um, but I just kind of gave you a, 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 a understanding uh, in my own words and uh, uh, in kind of a little more detail. Um, uh, but you can just follow through with the notes. That's okay. What I've said is uh, is mostly uh, there. Uh, just the little things that uh, in the in the beginning when I when I talked about uh, you know Romans is considered as a theological and doctrinal book and about uh, uh, about uh, you know uh, the the Israelites and how they are not mentioned uh, in the New Testament and what is mentioned in the New Testament the key doctrines. Those are little extra uh, notes, so you can uh, follow through. Uh, you may not be able to catch uh, everything and jot down all the extra points uh, uh, during the class lecture, but uh, the the video of the uh, class lecture will be posted on the Google Stream page, so you could always go back uh, to that video and you can listen to it again, and then uh, you can just make um, uh, uh, 
jot down the points. But when we come to word to word uh, explanation or phrases or verses, uh, we'll kind of stick to what is there in the notes because um, it will be given detailly. But if there is anything extra and you sense it's not there, you can uh, jot down the points. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, I hope that helps. I just didn't want to stick to the notes because sometimes students feel, I mean, we just, what's the point? You know, we just have the notes, we can read it, then, you know, what's the point in attending a lecture? So I thought, like, <laughs> you know, I see Kumar is laughing here. Right? Yeah, so uh, just giving a, uh, uh, using the notes, but just helping you to uh, looking at it in a more detailed uh, way, which would help you. And you can always go back and listen to the lecture. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Elisha, did the uh, did uh, the explanation help for your query? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining class. I'll um, see you on Friday uh, again for another hour. Uh, have a wonderful day. God bless you all. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.